In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place. Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Memphis Mayor-elect Paul Young, tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us. I am joined tonight by Paul Young, Mayor-elect, City of Memphis. Thanks for being here again. Thank you for having me, as it, always. In your new role. Yes, um, glad to be here. Congratulations, first of all. Thank you. Um, the, you're, what, what, are we a month from elections? Two Three, months. Two oh, months oh, from no, election. a month past election, month. two months until I actually take, take office. Take, take job. Well, we'll start a bit today with, um, I just want to talk a little bit about the campaign and some of that, but we'll mostly talk yeah. about policies and hiring and agenda and so okay. on. So, but just to start, y- you, you were, how did you win? And when you look back on it, I mean, what did you do right to, yeah. to win in a very crowded field? Um, I think I was consistent. Uh, we started relatively early. We, we got into this race September 1st, and even before that, we had uh, started just touching people in our communities. Uh, we, we had this strategy where we uh, went to one person's house and talked to about 15 or 20 of their friends, and then somebody in that audience heard me speak and said, let me introduce you to my friends. And so it really was a grassroots campaign, uh, and we did that up until uh, the election. And uh, we stayed consistent on our messaging that, you know, brighter days are coming for our city. We spoke about optimism and hope without burying our head in the sands and tackling our challenges head on. The, the, um, you'd never run for office, right? You yeah. had never held office. Um, the, what was it like? I mean, unfortunately or fortunately or just the reality of, of elections is, is raising money. And I think you raised maybe a million dollars? Uh, 1.2. 1.2. Yeah. What was that like? Well, uh, it was it was grueling, um, but um, you know we we knew that we had a, a strong message, and you know the campaign itself. I, although I've never been the candidate, I've worked in local government sure. and, and in local politics for the past twenty years, so it wasn't that unfamiliar. Uh, I think the fundraising side was was pretty grueling in terms of just you know maximizing uh, you know my network and reaching out but people believed in the message that we had they believed in what they've seen from me in the past and they know that you know when they invest with me they're, they're investing in good governance and a brighter future for the city what, what is your take on I mean turnout was very very low um, yeah. the uh, and because there is no runoff you won by some thousands of votes uh, past uh, uh, Sheriff Bonner right. um, and run with a very small percentage, you know, it's a very small percentage of the people elected and even obviously smaller percentage of the overall eligible voters in the city. Does that undermine your your agenda? Does that does that deny you a mandate? Does it do any of those things that people talk about? It doesn't undermine my agenda at all. I mean, I think what we saw is apathy. I think people feel like government doesn't necessarily work for them and so they'd rather not play a part. Um, but my goal is the same regardless of how many people voted. Uh, we won, and so my goal now is to make sure that we govern for all of the people, whether they voted for me, whether they voted for another candidate, or whether they didn't vote at all. My goal is to make sure that we govern and that we run city government on behalf of the people of our city. Well, let's kind of begin to talk about the transition, but do you, I mean, in the in the weeks, the month since election, I mean, I think, I know you've talked to current mayor, Jim Strickland. Yeah. Do, you, do you then reach out to the people you're going to be working with? Do you talk to Lee Harris? Do you talk to state officials? Do you talk to the DA? I mean, wh- how does that yeah. work? I imagine there's a certain amount of them saying congratulations, but is there, are there conversations that are about policy and, and planning with other government officials? Yeah, already? absolutely. Um, uh, I've obviously had a lot of conversations with Mayor Strickland. I've seen him quite a bit because we're, we're working on a lot of things over the transition. Uh, I've seen Mayor Harris. We hadn't had in-depth conversations, but we certainly will. And we've always had a, a good working relationship. I've already had a, a great meeting with uh, D.A. Mulroy uh, to talk about some of the things that I've talked about on the campaign trail. Uh, when we talk about public safety, which is certainly top of mind for everyone My goal is to make sure that we are galvanizing our whole community together. That means 
all of us sitting at the table on a very frequent basis, working together to minimize the crime and violence that we're seeing in our community, and we have to do it together. And so uh, I'll be talking to Mitt Mulroy, uh, Tarek Sugarman, other judges. Um, I've talked to the superintendent. We're going to have a unified force when it comes to moving our city forward. We can talk about force, uh, police force. Have, have yeah. you met with Chief Davis? Yeah, I've had a couple of conversations uh, with Chief Davis to talk about uh, the future of MPD, her desires. Uh, we're still finalizing uh, our decisions, and I think she's going to be meeting with the transition team next week. All of our um, our chiefs and directors, they're going to have their own uh, separate conversations with our transition team, and we'll have those recommendations in the coming weeks. And so, and those are right, the recommendation to keep or to to look for someone else across correct. the board. Across the board, yeah, yeah. across yeah. the board. Have you worked with Chief Davis? And you're, you're you've been in government. As you said you're cur- you are yeah. current, and you will be until you become mayor on what January first. You're the head of Downtown Memphis Commission. Before that, you worked. You ran um, director of Housing and Community Development. Right. Uh, what did you do before that? I was the director of legislative affairs for uh, Mark Luttrell in Shelby County. That's right. Okay. Yes. So um, you know a lot of these people, yes. right? I mean, you know the, the sort of operation. But with Chief Davis, how much did you work with Chief Davis? Yeah, in your I've worked pretty closely with her. You know, obviously in downtown Memphis, uh, we have seen some challenges over the past couple of years since I've been there. It's had some unfortunate incidents. And um, we worked pretty closely in response to some of the things we've seen around um, you know, some of the traffic incidents we've had downtown, the unfortunate uh, shootings we've had on Beale Street about two years ago. And in each instance, I've worked very closely yeah. with Chief Davis and her team. I would try, I'd try to get you to make some news, but you're saying it'll go to the transition team. Yes. There's, it's a big team, lots of different sort of committees and areas of government. They'll right. come back to you, and, but ultimately it's your decision. Yeah, so, so the transition team, there's a personnel group, the people appointments group. Uh, that's three individuals, uh, former president of University of Memphis, David Rudd, uh, Chris Winton, former HR exec at FedEx, uh, and Emily Greer, uh, former uh, chief of staff over at ALSAC St. Jude. So uh, very um, qualified folks that are going to help make some recommendations to me. You, you mentioned it in, uh, it's somewhere right after you won um, a, a you wanted to have a pandemic level response yeah, to yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it. Talk about what that means and, and talk about the reception you've got from people like DA, uh, uh, Mulroy, and Tariq Sugarman, head of the uh, yeah. judge of the. When I talk about court. the pandemic like response, um, during the pandemic, uh, all seven mayors of Shelby County, the regional mayors around Shelby County, all of the CEOs of the major hospitals, all of the division directors in city government, county government, we were on a call every week talking about how are we going to reduce the level of the virus in our community. My goal is to make sure that we have that same urgency around reducing the level of crime and violence that we're seeing in our community. And so we need the mayors in our community. We need the district attorney, the judges, the the school superintendent, and others to be coming together. It may not be weekly, but it needs to be a very frequent basis to talk about how we're going to reduce the level of violence that we're seeing in our community. And it's been received very well. And Including one that people focus on, and we focus on some at Daily Memphian, is the judges. The judges yeah. are elected, elected for eight-year yeah. terms. There's, it's, a, it's a strange... Um, I don't want to be pejorative when I say this, but it's it's they are they are ultimately accountable to the people who elected them, maybe right. to some degree to the state right. and the you know in terms of how things roll up in the appeal system and so on. Judges you've talked to have been receptive to, to yeah. talking more. The only with you judge as I've mayor? talked directly to about this is uh, Judge Tarek Sugarman, and he certainly was was very receptive and had a pretty good relationship yeah. with him prior to the election. Uh, but I'll talk to more, and I, I, yeah. I presume that they will be because it's literally a conversation. It's a conversation around how we have a shared understanding around what needs to ha- what is happening and what needs to happen. To reduce what we're seeing. For, in terms of the, 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 the parts of, of public safety, criminal justice that, that you as mayor will control, which is primarily the police force, but Correct. other parts and pieces. But do you see big shifts in how the police department operates, how police officers are deployed, how, um, you know, how they pulling people over? How, are there big shifts in the air with the police force? Yeah. So first, let me say, when we talk about public safety, MPD is a big part of it from the suppression side, but public safety is all of the things. And so we're certainly going to make investments in other areas. And we get to those. Yeah, we'll get to those. But speaking to MPD specifically, 
My goal is obviously to con- continue to work to increase the complement, but we also have to focus on what are we going to do in the meantime. And that, mean, that to me means being more efficient with who we have. How are we deploying our officers? How much time are they spending on the various tasks during their day so that we can make sure that we're maximizing where they are and what they can be doing? The second part is investing in technology, uh, using things in, in like cameras that can uh, identify where things are happening in a more efficient way, uh, maximizing technology such that you have artificial intelligence on the camera that can see certain act- actions. Like uh, if Eric decides to go and bust a window on Beale Street, we now have the technology that identifies that action and alerts someone without someone having to watch the screen. Those are the types of things that we're going to be doing, as well as using drones to, instead of cars chasing people, we can have a drone following someone uh, and then apprehending them on the back end, which is much safer. How long those technology implementations will take? One month, six months, a year, two years? I mean, it'll probably happen over the course of a year. Uh, It'll take a while. Obviously, you're on supply chain and have to make sure you get all the things in. But I can tell you the MPD is already thinking about some of these things. And so some of it can be deployed even quicker. And cost effectively? I mean, is that yeah, does yeah. that is is that in the budget or right, you're about to propose a budget that'll be one of the first things you do, we I think. We will certainly uh, include things in the budget that is necessary, but we also have funds that the MPD has recently received. I think there's about a $40 million state grant that Mayor Strickland and MPD has secured from the state, and I don't know that they fully programmed how that'll be used. And so, you know, we're, we're going to use the resources that we have available to do everything that we can to make sure that we are stopping the chaotic environment. The number one thing I want to say is that people have to see a reduction in the chaos. When you're driving on the streets and somebody almost mows you off the road, That's an indication of chaos. When you go to a party and you come outside and your windows are busted and on the ground, that's an indication of chaos. When we can reduce those small things, we are going to have a dramatic impact on the way people perceive our city and how they feel. Uh, with that technology, I mean, does that change the goal? I, I can't remember if your goal was 24 or 2,500 police officers. Does, it, does that shift at all, given technology? No, I mean, I think we still have to start moving, keep pushing towards the goal. Um, if we see some dramatic reduction when we're using the technology, then maybe we adjust the goal. But I think you keep the goal where it is. Okay. Um, Let's move on. We make circle back to, to crime and public safety. Well, actually, I want to stay with that and talk about some of those. You talked about police being um, a big part of it is the suppression. But there are other things from I, mean, I think this morning we were recording this on Thursday morning. Um, D.A. Mulroy has, you know, we did a big story on some of the businesses he shut down and some residents where they are nuisance, where there's repeated crimes mm-hmm. there. It, 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 I think, probably is welcomed by a lot of people that yeah. nuisance properties. In the end, I think it was maybe four. There were two, a couple of convenience stores and a couple of apartments. Um, is there more on that? You've worked on blight issues right. a, a lot in your career uh, in, in and around the city government. What are those other things that yeah. you think you can turn the dial on? Well, as I mayor? think there's a, there's a concept called crime prevention by environmental design, like how buildings are de- designed and laid out. You know, we'll be looking at things like that. So, you know, just thinking about an intersection and how open and wide an intersection is. If it's open and wide, then it uh, accommodates itself for doing the donuts in the middle of the inter- intersection. So you can make those things tighter from a design perspective that reduces instances of those things happening. If the things around the community looked uh, blighted and neglected, if it looks like no one cares, people behave as such. And so making investments in the community to do those things. And then the other thing is thinking about how can we actually intervene If we know which young people are headed down, and I'm not talking about those just under the age of 18. I just mean people under the age of 30. And you see that they're headed down the wrong road. They've had certain instances uh, of interaction with the law. We should be directing programs and interventions toward them proactively instead of waiting until we have to hold them accountable. Isn't that what, is it a block 901 or 901 block? 901 block. um, The Youth uh, Villages program. uh, Memphis Allies. There are many programs that are active and you know, we have to come up with data sharing agreements uh, so that we can identify who's headed down the wrong path and then, you know, do the things to stop them from, from going further. The, um, uh, 
Let's move to about halfway through the show here. Let's move through to some economic development related things. Um, the stadiums are big. I mean, they are yeah. both civic investments. They are economic development. They are. There's a lot to it. There's a there's a negotiation underway uh, between the city and the U of M on the the um, Liberty Bowl improvements, FedEx Forum, and the Grizzlies. Do you expect? I guess the first question is: Do you expect those to be finalized before you are inaugurated? Um, you know, I've, I've just been recently brought in to those conversations and progress is being made. Uh, I'm hopeful that we can at least have a framework for how we move forward by the end of the year. But, um, you know, regardless of whether it happens before the end of the year or after, my goal is the same to make sure that we uh, are able to support the University of Memphis and their ambitions. And then we are able to keep the Memphis Grizzlies in our community, which is, is so important for our city. Is, is there enough money? Uh, there's never enough money, but we are a creative community and a creative city, and so we're thinking about some ways to uh, ensure that we reach those goals. Well, is some that's been talked about, I don't know how much been reported, but, I mean, is changing sort of the TDZ downtown. Mm-hmm. The MLGW building is, is, with MLGW moving out of its headquarters, could that become part of a new revenue stream? Have you been part of those conversations as you're in your role as head of DMC? Yeah, I, I mean, certainly I've had some, some, yes, I've had conversations as okay. role of DMC and certainly as we, we start yeah. thinking about what potential revenue opportunities are going to look like. So everything's on the table. We're having conversations about what any opportunities uh, in the downtown area could be to support getting this project executed. Um, does that also include, I mean, I think it's not a secret that part of what the Grizzlies want is not just improvements within the, the, the forum, but improvements around downtown, you know, whether that's streetscape and lighting and safety issues like you just right. talked about right. or more kind of entertainment options and so on. Is that part of the conversation? Yeah, I mean, they certainly want to make sure that the environment around uh, any new stadium uh, is conducive to a new stadium. Uh, and so certainly those are things that they're, they're exploring as well. Um, well, a couple other projects. We just story this week that Liberty Park, the fairgrounds redevelopment, which you were originally part of yeah, at, in your role as, as uh, H, at HCD and expanding and changing the is it a t- it's a TDZ also TDZ, yeah, yes. tourism development zone which works. Where's Bill when we need him? Bill's out sick today. Uh, <laughs> yeah. to, to, you could describe it yeah, too, but it. let's go and do it real quick. What, what is a TDZ? Because so we're throwing that around, but it's a very important. It takes sales taxes in a geography. At a baseline level, you build something, generates a lot more taxes. There's a, a growth in sales taxes. That increment is used to pay for the thing that you're building. Okay. To that end, it looks like right as of right now, Liberty Park right. is underwater right. because it's the, the, the sports complex has opened, but there's been no development of the hotel, apartments, kind of entertainment complex on the, what is that, the central north-facing right. side where the, right. where the, the fields and the, 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 baseball, the old yeah. baseball stadium were. What's going on there? What 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 what's your understanding of what's going on yeah. there and what will you do as mayor to move that forward? Yeah, so I mean the project started just in time for the pandemic and so, you know, all of the private development that was intended to go along with the youth sports facility just hadn't been executed yet. I know that there are a lot of conversations with the development team uh, and they're working towards getting a start uh, in the, over the next year. Uh, and so what's happening is the city is having to contribute to pay for those uh, bond payments over the next year or two. Um, it's not the end of the world. Uh, it's something that uh, the city accounts for as part of the risk and evaluation for when you issue those bonds. Uh, the city has the ability uh, to make the payments, but certainly would prefer not to have to make them uh, in the future. And so we're going to do all that we can to make sure we get those private developments executed both on that site and in other areas in the TDZ, which is much bigger than just the fairgrounds or, or Liberty Park site. Okay, and, and Sam Hardiman in the Daily Memphian had a much deeper dive on this and the follow-up story, so I won't take up too much more of our time right here with that. Let's start with some other sort of big projects in limbo, some that you have been, um, I think, directly or at least tangentially involved in. The, the, the tourism people will say we need a convention center hotel right. badly. That's a, that's a hotel with, what, 400 to 600 rooms. Yeah. It really limits our, our ability in Memphis to get bigger 
um, conventions in town because they want to be able to put everyone in one or two hotels. The deal with Lowe's fell through. Mm-hmm. Um, the deal down at the Carlisle's um, development, um, one Beale area, yeah. fell through for a convention center hotel. Is that a priority for you and, and to, to get a convention center yeah, hotel we're, built? We're certainly going to continue to work hard. We know we need a convention center hotel in our community, and uh, we're going to work to execute it. What's been the missing piece? Um, we were really close on one bill. Uh, I think the market just, you know, you had the war in Ukraine and all of these external factors, factors that just pushed the market slightly beyond where it was economically feasible. Uh, but um, I think it's just going to take commitment, finding the right site, finding the right development teams that are willing to double down on Memphis. And, and are those development teams, I mean, what is your take on where the city run, like the city, I think, essentially ran the youth development complex. They were essentially the developer. They didn't hire, they, there's a different company that came in that runs right. it and owns right. it or right. runs it. Right. What's your relation, when you think about these projects, is it time to have a private developer with a contract with the city or should these developments be run by someone at HCD or someone who's within the city government? Yeah, I mean, I think the youth sports facility is a little bit different because that's essentially a a convention center for sports. Uh, And it makes sense for the city to own and build it. Uh, When you talk about a hotel, there are different models. There are cities that have built uh, convention center hotels, and they own and manage that hotel, and they contracted out the management with a uh, a private party. I think any of those scenarios have to be on the table. Uh, Sometimes local government has to be involved just to make sure that you're mitigating some of the risk that the private sector uh, won't take. The um, uh, NLGW, um, we talked about lighting, environment. I mean, it's mm-hmm. streetlights yeah. um, that were in the middle of MLGW is in the middle of putting um, LED lights everywhere. Doug McGowan will be on the show in a couple of weeks, a month or so. Um, he had said, I think in January when he was on the show, right after he first got the job, he said, you know, I can't remember the exact number, but by one year from yeah. this coming January, he'd have 90, 95 percent of the streetlights operating. Yeah. Is your sense that we're on track for that? Uh, for my conversations with Doug, yes, they are. I mean, I think it's 77,000 street lights that they are uh, working to execute. And uh, I know in downtown Memphis, they have done quite a few other ones around the FedEx Forum and uh, that area and that part of downtown. Uh, I've seen them out on the streets now when I've driven down airways. I think a band of the lights were out the other day, but they're working to bring them back. So I think they're on track, and it's a really important project for our community. We have to get the lighting that we need from a public safety perspective and just to make it uh, feel more comfortable. And, and if you, during the campaign, you didn't want to commit to hiring anyone or keeping anyone, so you know, Doug McGowan included. But uh, you've worked with Doug over yeah. the, the years. Do you have confidence that he's taken MLGW in the right direction? Yeah, I've had some some discussions with Doug, and he's talked to me about the plans. And, you know, for me, it's about making sure that whoever is at the helm of any of these organizations or divisions uh, is forward-thinking and thinking about the future. And I feel like they're doing that. Um, We hadn't made any final decisions, but I think they're on the right track. Uh, MATA announced recently, they've suspended this decision for now, but they announced that they're going to cut a a lot of bus service, eliminate certain routes after 7 p.m., partly because of maintenance and ultimately money and, you know, being able to maintain very old Mm -hmm. buses. The trolley downtown has been closed. Uh, The Riverfront Loop is, what, nine, almost nine years or more that it's been not running, and the Madison um, line has not been running. Gary Rosenfeld, who was on the show about last spring, said, look, by spring of 2024, We'll have the, the, the Riverfront Loop in place and operating. We'll have Madison operating. Mm-hmm. Are you confident that, that both on the bus service side and the trolley side, things are going in the right direction? Well, I hadn't had an opportunity to sit down with Gary yet. Um, he did reach out. My schedule has been a little crazy, so I will be talking to him soon. Uh, I'm glad to hear that they suspended the plan to cut services uh, for now. Uh, I've seen a big outcry from the community, and we want to make sure that people can still get where they need to go. Uh, we're going to have some discussions, and I want to have more in-depth dialogue with them before I say whether they're on the right track or not. But uh, transportation is significantly important in our community, especially when we know there are so many people without resources. And so uh, it's going to be an important area for fo- of focus, and we'll have those dialogues. The, uh, Ro- I mean, Jim Strickland, who will be on the show for two, a two-part show coming up uh, in the next week, week or two, talking about his, his eight years in, in, as mayor. Um, he touts a number of successes. One is, is accelerating how often streets are paved, road mm-hmm. improvement. 
do you think, is there room to accelerate that more? Is, are, are roads being paved at a proper pace? What's, what do you hear from people and what do you plan for them? Yeah, I think Mayor Strickland will tell you that one of the number one things you hear is do something about the potholes. Has that people. been your experience too? Yeah, well, it's not number one. Number one, I hear crime now, yeah, sure, but um, uh, potholes is probably number two. Uh, I think the Strickland administration has done a great job in that in that vein. Uh, I think it was about 25 years was the paving cycle. Now it's down to 12 or so. I'd love to get it down even, even lower than that uh, because we need people to feel the services of local government and the driving down the street is one of those everyday experiences that people have and it makes them feel like their government is working for them and so yeah uh, so many more things we can talk about we only have about a minute and a half left but in terms of the overall fiscal health of the city you know where people talk about we're going to hit this positive this good fiscal cliff where with some debt refinancing it's going to happen either next year i think 2025 when the 50 million sort of gets freed up do you still anticipate that as you start thinking about a budget, that there is this fiscal relief that's coming up? And what about interest rates are way up? I mean, cost of borrowing right. for cities, municipalities is much higher. What's your sense of the financial state of the city? Well, I, I think the financial state is, is pretty strong for the city. Um, we are looking forward to that debt cliff when we have roughly $50 million available in our annual budget moving forward. And so uh, we're going to make decisions in the meantime to help um, you know, enhance our community, and we're going to look forward to that opportunity to make even deeper investments to advance our city. Um, what now are you focused on in terms of you have a transition team? Um, you are a bit past the win, and now, you know, the clock is ticking for a whole lot of, of ideas that you have talked about an agenda, uh, priorities, and expectations. Yeah, the clock is ticking, and uh, for me, the most important thing is right, making sure we have the right people on the team. And so our transition team is working very hard. I'm having one-on-one dialogues with all of the directors and chiefs. Uh, each of the directors and chiefs will be meeting with the transition team who will make an ultimate recommendation to me, but the conversations are going well. and. You know, we're, we're going to open up our portal soon where individuals can submit resumes if they're interested in working with the young administration. Uh, and so we're really excited about this next chapter. Do, do you expect, I, I would ask you who's going to stay and who's going to go. You're not going to answer that. You're, as you say, you're in the middle of assessing that. But right. do, you, do you expect to keep quite a few people from the administration? You've worked with the administration. You were part of it before yeah. you went to the Downtown Memphis Commission. Yeah, there's not, there's not many people in the administration that I don't know and have not worked with at some level. Um, there'll certainly be some that stay. There'll be some that, that move on. Uh, we're still making those decisions, but you'll see some familiar faces and some new ones. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Uh, crime, obviously, uh, is heavy on people's minds right now. Um, you, have you met yet with Chief Davis and, and the, the head of the police department? And, and what is your approach for public safety um, as you move towards January? Yeah, we, I've had a couple of conversations uh, with Chief Davis right now and, and really just talking about her perspective for the future of MPD and what types of things uh, we can work on together and collaboratively to advance our city. Uh, I think she meets with um, the transition team next week, and so we'll have a recommendation. But whoever's in that role, my commitment is to ensure that we have someone who's going to be transparent, who's going to engage with the community, and most importantly, galvanize the force to get different results for the people of Memphis. Do you expect, in terms of getting different results, a whole lot of different strategies? I mean, is it, is it a matter of remaking the police department? I don't know if it's uh, a matter of remaking the police department. I think it's a matter of engaging them to do things uh, differently and more efficiently. Um, I, I think we have, um, you know, the programs, the initiatives, uh, the deployment strategies, but it's, it's having the motivation uh, to go out and police on the streets, to, to enforce some of the, the rules on the road, to uh, do that, take that next, next step on investigating to make sure that we get those individuals off the streets. And then it's the other work that we have to do with the other partners from um, the DA to the judges and others to make sure that the ones that are terrorizing our neighborhoods and communities, they stay in jail. Uh, for the appropriate amount of time. You, you talked at one point about a, quote, pandemic-level response. Yeah. You know, and, and as head of DMC during COVID, you were on a call every week, you know, heads of hospitals, division heads within the city, pe- regional mayors, suburban mm-hmm. mayors. Do you, you, is that what you're expecting, is some kind yeah. of regular gathering, be it on Zoom or in person, of all the people directly or tangentially involved in public safety? That's exactly what I expect us to do. I think, I think that... 
you know, we have to elevate the urgency of how we're addressing crime, and the public has to see it. It's not enough for us to just meet in the back room. Uh, people have to see that there's all of these leaders at the helm having these convenings. I don't think people are naive enough to believe that crime is going to stop overnight, but they should believe that our government is working hard together uh, to address the issues they're seeing. The, um, uh Let's talk about the stadiums real quick. Uh, big, big negotiations over Liberty Bowl, FedEx Forum, their state money, city money, all these parts and pieces. Do you expect the um, agreements with those two entities to be finished before you take office, or will that be something that you'll have to complete? Well, I'm hopeful that by the end of the year we can have some form of a, a high-level agreement on the, in principle and in general with a lot of steps to execute. Uh, but regardless of whether it happens before or after, my, my goal will still be the same to ensure that uh, we do the things to get University of Memphis in the next level conference and that we keep the Memphis Grizzlies in the city of Memphis. Is there enough money to get those, um, both those deals done? There's never enough money, but uh, we are creative and we'll have enough strategies to identify how to get the capital stacks done. All right. Well, again, thanks for being here. Congratulations again. We look forward to having you on when you are mayor sometime in the first of January or February. But thanks. We are out of time. Um, again, as I mentioned, coming up in very soon, Jim Strickland in two episodes, Doug McGowan coming up soon, other shows coming up. If you missed any of today's show, you can get the full episode at WKNO.org or you can download the podcast of the show wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks very much. And we'll see you next week.